female and women making a difference, uh, which is a phrase I, I don't like very much. <laughs> so I, then I thought about what sort of difference are we going to talk about? And these are the usual people that we think of as making a difference. You know, the abolitionists, and there were quite a few of those in Rhode Island, religious reformers. Alex and I were just talking about Anne Hutchinson a minute ago, politicians, suffragists, union leaders, society. And I'm not going to talk about any of those. I'm going to talk about th these five women who in some ways were role models rather than major change makers, but they were also um, important nationally rather than just locally. So we are, I'm talking about women who all of them spent at least some time in Rhode Island and did some of their important work in Rhode Island, uh, but then most of them went on to other things. So you, these are the five I'm going to talk about. Uh, Lillian Muller Gilbreth, who was an in, industrial engineer and mother of 12 children, celebrated in Cheaper by the Dozen. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who was an author, a feminist author, but in the time she was in Rhode Island, she was a gymnast. And so the idea of Victorian women being gymnasts is quite strange. Just me, I don't want to see. Anyway. Um, oh, I've gone ahead of myself here. Um, Christiana Bannister and Elizabeth, Nancy Elizabeth Prophet are black women, black road, born in Rhode Island women. Uh, Christiana was uh, professionally a hairdresser and she also spent a lot of time doing good works. She was a philanthropist. Elizabeth Prophet, I've done that again. How do I do this? Elizabeth Prophet was um, a sculptor and an artist, and she was the first black woman to um, graduate from RISD. Uh, she did a lot of her important work elsewhere, but came back to Rhode Island eventually. And Betsy Bowen, who I'm very fond of, became Madame Jumel, and incredibly rich, one of the richest women in 19th century New York, but in some ways she was a bad example to us all. So those are the five women that I'm gonna talk about. So here we are, here's Lillian. On the left is the um, cover of the original Cheaper by the Dozen. I'm sure some of you have read that. Uh, you're probably of an age, some of you, to have read it in middle school because it used to be read. And if you can see, it's written by Frank B. Gilbreth Jr. and Ernestine Gilbreth Carey. So those are the uh, two of the 12 children now this picture on the right, it was taken in Nantucket where they'd bought a house in, it was probably taken about 1919, 1920. And not all the children are yet born. You see Lillian is there looking a little exhausted with the latest baby on her knee. And there are all these various children in the back of the car. I think there were 10, if I remember right. Frank is her husband. Um, and he was badly, um, he wasn't injured, he, he became very ill during war service in the First World War. And so um, it was possible that he, he might have died, but instead they went on to get have several more children, which seems a wee bit irresponsible. The next slide shows us what they did when they were in Rhode Island. And this is that they um, or Frank, invented something called Thurbligs. So if you look at Thurbligs, it's almost Gilbreth backwards. You can see that if you start with the G, Gilbreth, at the New England Buck Company, which used to be, well, the building still is up Broad Street, and um, it made braiding machinery. And that's Frank, the fatter one on the left, looking there with a braiding machine. They're very complicated machines that, um, that braid things to make covers for um, telephone wires. Remember, they used to be covered in those days with a sort of uh, fabric. There I am. Um, and he came up with these principles, which I've just done this again. Um, 
of how you pick something up. So it, I've just picked up a pencil. I searched over on my desk here. I found it. I selected it. I grasped it. I'm holding it and so on. And this, he tried to break down everything that people did into these many um, movements. And then they would have a um, efficiency system to try and get people to um, work more efficiently. And Lillian was having numerous babies at this time. They were living up um, on Brown Street in Providence. Um, and she was also uh, getting a PhD from Brown at the same time as having numerous babies. Um, but she was doing much of the advice for Frank who went into the, the company up on Broad Street to try and reorganize the way they did things. And she became quite famous for having 11 children in a career. Now it's 11 because one of them died at age five of diphtheria while, while they were in Providence. But here she is as a widow because Frank went and died on her when the youngest was two and the oldest was I think 17 or 18 maybe. And so she's got the 11 children under the age of 18 there. And here she is on the left in this sort of cartoon. Um, the children asking her, one of them wants new shoes. Um, one of them wants his fraternity dues, perhaps he's at college by this time. And they're all arguing amongst themselves. But on the right, it says she's spending two hours a day in the office, I think it's two hours. And um, the idea that she can get so much done in two hours a day is quite extraordinary. But she became very famous in the 1930s um, for this combining family and career business. And this is a picture of her probably in the 20s, early 30s. And these are two of the things that she actually did, which are interesting and which are part of our everyday lives. Um, one is putting um, shelves in the door of fridges, which is, a, you know, it's a no brainer, but they, the early fridges, the only ice boxes didn't have that. And she also apparently invented the pedal bin. Now, the reason she's doing this is that when Frank died in 1924, the commercial, the industrial um, contracts they'd got, most of them didn't want her. They said the men wouldn't um, accept advice from a woman. So she switched into domestic and retail and consumer businesses. Oh, my phone's bing dinging at me. Um, and that's what she did for the rest of her career. She um, organized what she called the, um, the handicapped homemakers kitchen for women with disabilities. She uh, worked a lot with people with disabilities trying to make their life more efficient. She worked in the Hoover administration. She was a Republican but in the days when Republicans were a bit different. And um, so she was actually in uh, Washington and in the White House working, trying to uh, do something in the early days of getting, um, working through the um, depression, not very successfully, but she was there. She was important with the Girl Scouts. She, I found when I was writing about her, that I wished somehow that the next biography I was going to do would be of someone who died young because she went on working till she was 90, which was really quite exhausting. Just a small commercial. This is the book I wrote about her. You can get it on Amazon and all sorts of things. So if you haven't read it, it's a good read. So it's called Making Time. And it's a life beyond Cheaper by the Dozen. And I like that picture at the top of her with several of the children. It's probably at the time they were living in Providence that one was taken. They moved away from Providence in 1920, but they were here for eight years, during which time they did the New England butt thing, they organized their system, and she got her PhD from Brown. My second person is Charlotte Perkins Gilman, um, who some of you might have heard of because this yellow wallpaper, this novella that she wrote, is um, was rediscovered, I think, in the 70s or the 80s with the women's movement. Um, and 
many people read it. She also wrote, uh, wrote more serious things like Women in Economics, which is, as you see, a study of the economic relation between men and women as a factor in social evolution. So, and this is Charlotte. They, she lived in Rhode Island as a, a young woman and went to RISD as a, as a day student. They all were day students in those days. And she loved going to the gym. Now, this is in the days when Victorian women weren't supposed to be doing anything very energetic. But on the left here, there's an advertisement for the sanitary gymnasium, which was in that building on the right. It was for ladies and children to broaden narrow chests and strengthen weak muscles. And the movement cure was for the treatment of extreme nervous prostration when all other means fail. And she used to go there two or three times a week and she loved it. She wrote about it. The first published thing she ever had was about her going to the gym. And these are just some pictures of the type of um, activities that might have been available in, in late Victorian times. We're talking about the 1880s. Those are dumbbells on the left. There's some girls stretching and who knows what they're doing there. And a boy with a sort of proto nautilus machine there with a very strange outfit for doing his exercise. They seem to have far too many clothes on. But she loved what she called the flying rings and they were on the ceiling and she'd um, go from one to another feeling very energetic. But then she got married to Walter Stetson, who is a rather handsome young man, as you'd agree. And he was an artist, and this is one of his paintings. And Walter was a fairly conventional sort of young man and thought that women should be um, at home and domestic and so on. So she stopped going to the gym and then she had a baby and then she had complete nervous prostration in that she cried, she couldn't get out of bed. This is postpartum depression. Now, if you remember two or three slides ago, the gym advertised itself for nervous prostration, but they didn't do that with her. They sent her down to Philadelphia to a very, very famous um, doctor at the time who happens in fact to be Barnaby Evans's great, great uncle, I, I believe. Um, and that was where she had the rest cure, where she had to lie in bed in a darkened room and be fed fattening things to fatten her up. They took away her pencils, her reading matter and uh, her paints and said, you must relax. This is the only way to get better. And she didn't. And she left her husband in, uh, soon after this and wrote the yellow wallpaper, which is the story of a woman having the rest cure and going slowly mad and seeing things crawling out of the yellow wallpaper. My third woman is Christiana Bannister, who is this hairdresser and philanthropist. And that's the portrait of her by her husband, um, Edward Bannister, who we'll see a picture of in a minute. The two things that she did as a philanthropist, one was to work with the 54th Regiment, Massachusetts, because she was living in Boston at that time, although she was born in Rhode Island, um, which was the black regiment that they talked about in Glory, the film, if you remember Glory from a few years ago. And when she was later, they moved to Providence after the Civil War, she and her husband, and later, towards the end of her life, she, she set up the Providence Home for Aged Coloured Women, which is what became eventually Bannister House. But I think a lot of people think it's named after him rather than her, but who knows. But she also earned her living. And as you see here, she's advertising in um, the abolitionist newspaper, the, uh, the Liberator in Boston, that she is a hair doctress. She can fix your hair for you. And she, she has improvements in ch for shampooing, which is interesting, and hairdressing. It says, Madam Bannister, formerly Madam Carto, because she'd been married before she married Edward Bannister, would inform her kind and liberal patrons and the public 
that she's removed from one place to another. Where will be found her restorative, which prevents hair from turning gray and produces new in all diseases of the scalp. It's a miracle working stuff. Ladies waited on at their residences. So she'll go and do your hair at your place. And so this is what she is doing in the 1850s. She's earning a living, partly so her husband, her new husband, Edward Bannister, can start to hone his craft to be a painter, which is what he wanted to be. And there he is. He's actually, they sometimes say he's African-American, but he's African-Canadian. Um, I'm not sure he was ever an American citizen. He was born in Nova Scotia. But here we have him and the Massachusetts 54th flag, which you can see one of the places where the um, regiment fought was at Fort Wagner, which was where they made a heroic stand and maybe turned the um, direction of that part of the Civil War. Now, in 1864, this is a couple of years later, um, she is the president of the Colored Ladies Sanitary Commission of Boston, who were holding a fundraiser, a fair, in Mercantile Hall, Summer Street. And this was for the relief of disabled, colored Massachusetts soldiers and their families. So, um, this is one of her activities. It shows she's very much an uh, important part of the, uh, the Boston Black community at this time. Uh, many things got sold at this, um, this fair, including a portrait um, painted by her husband of, um, oh, what's the name? Robert Shaw, the, the colonel who was killed at Fort Wagner which has disappeared and I don't know where it is. I don't think anybody does. Um, and a, a Chickering's piano, which is quite an expensive good. So people had been giving big prizes to the raffles and selling all sorts of things. So that's what she did in um, her time in Boston as well as doing her hairdressing. And then they moved to Providence where they lived on Benevolent Street. And this is where she set up later the home for aged colored women on transit street that's the uh, house that it was it's i think it's just a private house now and her husband died and he's buried in north burial ground oops i've lost him sorry and he's got this very magnificent um monument which is a boulder with these iron uh plaques on it which says um, Bannister, uh, Edward Bannister, and that's a, an artist's uh, palette. And down below it says how he was an a important figure. And I went last week to check, but as yet there is no um, marker to um, Christiana. So I've checked this with uh, Ray Rickman, Apparently he's on her list, but before, and unless somebody comes up with some money, there won't be a marker to Christiana, who I think probably deserves a marker. My fourth woman is Elizabeth Prophet. As I said, she was the first black and, and indigenous woman to graduate from RISD. And that's a portrait of her at the right, looking very intense as she often was. On the left is one of her sculptures, which is in the RISD Museum now. And I think it was me, actually, that discovered that was her husband. Because many years ago, when I was doing some research on this, I found a niece of her ex-husband who gave me a photograph of the man she married, who was her uncle. And she, the, the woman who gave it to me was in her perambulator at the time, her baby carriage. So this is a long time ago, and he's a very handsome young man. He went to Hope High, he went to Brown, but didn't graduate. Um, so it's now on display as her husband. She uh, 
graduated, tried to make a living as a painter, but failed. She left and went to Paris and where she didn't do that much better in that she um, didn't sell many things. She was perfectionist. She started from scratch. She kept going and going and going, working through the night, um, sometimes forgetting to eat. And she kept a diary. And this is one page of it. This is fantastic handwriting. She writes, sculpture is an expensive medium, I know, but I have not chosen my medium of expression. It has chosen me. What more can I say? I want to work. I want to work. I must work. I live for that alone. Forgive me, I beg you for writing like this, for I am driven to desperation, Elizabeth Prophet. Through this letter to Louise W. Brooks, her secretary secured for me from the Students Fund of Boston, $30 a month for two years. It stopped as suddenly as it began at the end of that time without warning. And so in spite of all, I have gone on. And she wrote that in 1936. Um, but she was, her husband went out to stay with her. And, um, that didn't work out. Eventually, she went back to America. And she was well connected with people in the Harlem Renaissance. And the left is County Cullen, the poet. The right is W.E.B. Du Bois. And both of them tried to help her. And for a while, in her first visit back to uh, America, she was a very fashionable and uh, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, who was a, a Whitney and a Vanderbilt, um, supported her for a while and patronized her you know, in, in the sense of giving her space to work, but that didn't work very well. Eventually, Du Bois, who bought one or two of her pieces, uh, found her a job. And this was down at Atlanta University where he was teaching. Um, and this shows her on the left here, probably at that period in Atlanta, where she taught for about 10 years. And, but she became increasingly um, eccentric. And along the way, people um, started thinking she's going a bit odd. Again, I interviewed a, a very, very elderly lady a while back who, whose husband was a sculptor. She was an African-American lady. And she said that he had been taught by her in Atlanta and that um, she wandered around with a big cloak on and sometimes with a live rooster underneath her armpit, which is an extremely strange thing to be doing. And eventually uh, Du Bois went off to Africa. And so without her uh, protector, as it were, she didn't stay at Atlanta and she went back to Providence. Um, where she tried to uh, become a paying sculptor, I mean, a paid sculptor, and it didn't work terribly well. She spent the last year or two of her life as a babysitter for a man out in Coventry, <coughs> whose wife was having her fourth baby. Um, but that didn't work very well. <laughs> and he took her back to her house, which was on the south side of Providence. It was, she'd inherited her father's house where she died aged 70 in 1960. She was the youngest of my five. Most of them lived to a great old age. The, the, the last picture um, part of this slide is the photo on the right, which is another of her sculptures, which, one which I like very much. I'm not sure whether it's on display these days, but RISD owns that one. Now my last and um, most remarkable woman is Madame Jumel, Mrs. Burr, born Betsy Bowen in Providence. Um, and the house on the left is the Maurice Jumel mansion in um, New York, in Manhattan, right up in the northern part of Manhattan, which has been a museum now for a number of years. To the right is a photo, a, a drawing of Aaron Burr as a younger man giving a hard look to Alexander Hamilton <clears throat> and she married him 
as her second husband after her French husband, Monsieur Jumel. The image in the middle is um, engraving she had done when she was in Paris in the 1850s. So that's what she looked like in the 1850s. But she didn't look like, well, she may have looked like that, but she didn't dress like that as a youngster. Um, on the left here, these very strange photos, is the old jail, bottom left, is the old jail at Halsey and Benefit Street, <clears throat> where, where she, her mother spent a bit of time. Her mother um, had been um, abandoned by her husband, who then fell off her uh, ship and was killed anyway, um, and had three children to look after. And so she seems to have perhaps turned to prostitution, this is her mother, to uh, make ends meet. And every so often the uh, law and order brigade in Providence would say, oh, we're not gonna have any more of this nonsense. Um, and they would attack the, room, the, the house where <clears throat> well, they thought, which they thought was a brothel and um, throw out the inhabitants, tear up their feather beds and things. And so little Betsy, who was seven when one of these things, one of these events happened, spent at least two um, periods in the Providence workhouse while her mother was occasionally in the Providence jail. What happened in the next few years is very, very unclear, as I'll explain in a minute. But the image on the right is said to be her in 1797 but it's not obvious it's not de known definitely that it's her when she's calling herself Madame de la Croix. Now there were French people in Providence and the idea is that she uh, linked up with a Frenchman who took her to New York and in the middle of the 1790s, where she may have um, stayed with him for a while. She's known to have acted on the stage, but then she met this French merchant and they got married in the 1804 and he made quite a lot of money. And at one time they lived here in the, on the left in the Place Vendôme when they went to live in France. And the image on the right is the Empress Josephine with some of her diamonds those and pearls actually. But um, Madame Jumel had some very magnificent diamonds which she said had once be ha belonged to, Madame, to uh, the Empress Josephine. Whether they did, whether they didn't, she was quite capable of making all sorts of stories, I don't know. So that's how wealthy she and her husband were for a while in the early part of the 19th century. Um, she went back to America in 1817, taking with her a shipload, shipload of old masters, or some of them would be copies of old masters, which she then displayed in, in a gallery in New York. And this was apparently the first major um, exposition of old masters in the United States. Then she adopted her sister's illegitimate daughter, right? <laughs> it's all very complicated this. And her sister's illegitimate daughter married someone and these are the two children of her sisters, of her niece, right? Um, who she brought up after her niece died. This portrait was made in uh, Rome in the early 18, in the 1850s. And it shows she's dressed in very expensive laces there. And it's a huge, almost, it's pretty well a life-size portrait. It is huge, this thing. So shipping that back to America would be quite a task. So she's brought up these two young people, her great niece and great nephew um, in luxury in her big house that we saw earlier on up in New York, sent them to expensive schools and all the rest of it. And this is the only photograph of her. And she is on the extreme right of this photograph, sitting with something on her lap, which could be a small child. 
And these are the adult um, members of her adoptive family. And she died in 1865 and left all her money, which was considerable, probably worth $15 million now, to charity. This did not go down very well with the relatives. And so her, the husband of her dead niece, right, uh, spoke to all the charities and said, we're going to um, contest this will because we think she must have been insane. She was 90 by that time. Um, we're going to contest the will. Uh, but if we give you $5,000 more now, will you uh, re give up your claim? And so most of the, uh, the charities did. And then um, what happened is that over the next 17, 20, yeah, 17 years, <clears throat> people came up out of the woodwork all over the place claiming that they were her illegitimate children and therefore they should inherit. And this one was one of the most plausible, but probably not true. And he called himself George Washington Bowen claimed at one point that George Washington was his father, which is a little unlikely, um, but later said that she was um, the baby, he was the baby that people had seen in her arms in 1795, just before she went to New York and abandoned the baby. Uh, this case went on and on and on and ended up in the Supreme Court where poor old George Washington Bowen was told that um, since most of the property was in trust to the relatives she'd brought up, the rest of it had been all gone in, in legal fees and there was nothing for him to claim. So poor old George Washington Bowen got nothing at all. And in conclusion, it seems to me there's many ways to make a difference. Uh, Lillian came up with pedal bins, which isn't the most important thing, but the idea of making work more efficient, kitchens more um, user-friendly is important. Charlotte Perkins Gilman uh, wrote some important works. Another one of hers is Her Land, which is a sort of feminist fantasy novel. Christiana Bannister, was important in philanthropic circles, both in Boston and in uh, Providence. Elizabeth Prophet made some beautiful pieces, despite her own mental fragility. And Madame Jubel, whose reputation suffered really badly as a result of all these trials and all these people claiming to be her illegitimate children. But despite that, she was a brilliant businesswoman and did her own thing throughout. So there I'm going to end by saying these women, all of whom spent a little while at least in Rhode Island, some of whom spent most of their lives here, uh, did make a difference. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jane. Uh, that was great. And uh, so many interesting stories there. So we'll go uh, just, I'm going to make, just take a two minute announcement interlude, and then we'll go to some question and answer. Um, so just a, a few quick international house announcements. Uh, if you look at Ina Woolman's background, we have a puzzle for sale. We were discussing that earlier. Um, it's on our website. There's a link in the chat. Um, so if you'd like an international house puzzle or get one as a gift, um, those are $30. Uh, we're open for people to pick things up. The house itself is closed for any activities. As you can imagine, our residents are living at the house, but otherwise we're closed for in-person activities. But there's a staff member here during the week. Uh, next week, we have Socrates Cafe, which is a discussion format. So it won't be a presenter, but we'll pose a question and then we'll have breakout rooms. It'll be more of a discussion format for people who enjoy that. That's next Wednesday. Um, we're, we're doing the schedule for January through April for these lunch talks. We have January and February preliminary speakers planned. 
if you have someone in mind or if you yourself want to speak at one of our lunches or a topic idea, feel free to reach out to myself or Risa. Uh, Risa is the program committee chair, uh, thankfully, post executive director in, uh, <laughs> in that capacity. So that's very helpful for me and the International House. But you can reach out to either of us if you have a speaker uh, that you'd like to see or a topic you'd like to see. Um, next, we may have a winter solstice poetry event um, in two weeks. It typically happens at the winter solstice in person. Um, I'm having a call about that on Thursday. So just stay tuned for that as a possibility. But we'll definitely have a Burns Night, which has been happening at International House for many years at the end of January. Um, it's going to be a ticketed event, and everyone who purchases a, purchases a ticket at least a week before the event will get a care package with some, um, some it, there won't be a haggis in there, but they'll have other treats um, in a Burns, Burns Night uh, tradition. So that's a Friday night. I believe it's January 28th, and we'll have- 29. 29. Thank you, Joe. And Joe will be the MC. And if you haven't come and seen Joe do his- do, do the uh, Burns routine, it's, it's, it's something. Um, so there'll be four, four actual presenters that night. And uh, so stay tuned, more there. And finally, it we'll, looks like we'll have an international student poetry event again in February. Um, one, one of the English language classes with international students is gonna, they're talking about that, doing some type of an event in, fri uh, in February. Wonderful. Um, so. A lot of announcements. I'll stop there. Um, if anyone else has any other things to quickly jump in and then we'll just turn it over to question and answer. You can put your questions in the chat or you could just unmute yourself and, and jump in. And I know, why don't you start and then we'll just- Will there be bagpipes at uh, Burns night? We're working on it. Thank you. We hope so. <laughs> Some virtual uh, version of it, yes. We'll see what we can do. Right, I can see a question from Risa asking me how I got interested in pursuing these women. <laughs> uh, how did I go about it? It's a long story. Well, fairly long. I was teaching at the Lincoln School in probably 1989 or 1990. And we were, um, doing a program called um, National History Day. And I love doing that because it's the sort of history I like to do, which uh, involves a lot of detective work. <clears throat> and the following year's topic was science and technology about which I knew almost nothing. And I noticed that there was a summer course at Brown called the History of Science which Joan Richards was going to do. <clears throat> so I rolled, enrolled for that. And um, I had to do a little project. Well, I'll tell you, it was the hardest thing I've ever done because you know my knowledge of uh, the history of science is about that much. <laughs> and, um, and I was having to read all about Archimedes or whoever, you know, half these people I've never even heard of. Um, it was hard work and I would lie on the sofa on hot afternoons feeling very faint about the whole thing. Um, but I had to do a project and I went to the library and decided to write a, an annotated bibliography of books that the, the girls at Lincoln might find useful to learn about history of science or technology. And I came across Lillian Gilbreth uh, getting a gold medal for something. And, and this surprised me because, you know, I'd vaguely knew Cheaper by the Dozen. And in that she's this rather sweet, motherly, kind woman who uh, helps, but is not in the gold medal league. And so I started doing a bit of investigation of that and realized that in fact, she was in the gold medal league. And I would even suggest that much of what Frank achieved was because of her. But anyway, her daughter didn't agree with me on that. But um, so that's how it really started. And then um, this is where in the early nineties and, and Lincoln School was having a terrible crisis. It was after the savings and loan thing. 
and the people were taking their children away from private schools because they couldn't afford it because they'd lost all their money. And Lincoln was in a bit of a mess. And I met Vanessa, somebody who said I could write a proposal to be the Rhode Island Krista McAuliffe Fellow, um, which was, uh, there's one per state. And these were produced with something to do with science, technology, space, or whatever. And I, I wanted to do that and just spend my time writing about Lillian, because I'd started taking the odd course, and I, may, I mean odd course, at Brown. And I wanted to continue with this. But this Vanessa, somebody, told me that I'd have to broaden it out. They wouldn't give me money to just do one person. So I came up with this list of the ones that, and I don't even see this, this is what it ended up as, my Rhode Island women's curriculum. Um, and there are 12 of them in here So that I found, actually more than 12, 12 chapters. Um, and so it was a very broad based thing. And at that time, the uh, Black Heritage Society's uh, papers were somewhat accessible because they were in CCRI Providence at that time. At least I could get into the room where they were. I think they've been hidden away for a long time since then. So, um, that's it really, that uh, it was serendipity in some ways that I wanted to write about Lillian. And I found myself, because I, I became the Krista McAuliffe Fellow for the state of Rhode Island, which is ludicrous because I was doing a women's history curriculum. I wasn't doing anything about science. I was working in a private school. I wasn't even a US citizen at that time, but I soon was. Um, the whole thing was quite ridiculous, but um, I was Rhode Island's Krista person. And um, so there we are, that's how it all started. Thank you. I, I, I feel like we're so fortunate that you had this experience because when I would be looking for speakers to talk about Rhode Island history, there are very few scholarly people who are writing about Rhode Island. At least I couldn't find any local people who, who were uh, pursuing that. <laughs> And did you do the research at, at the Historical Society as well, or, yeah? Rhode Island Historical Society, yes. Black Heritage. Um, the Lillian stuff, um, actually much of it is in the Smithsonian. So um, I think I used some of my grant money to go down there for a few days. And um, RISD Museum, RISD Archives. They're all over the place. So. All right, no, it's not just the Smithsonian. They're, they're also in uh, Purdue. So I spent, I spent actually, I think, two weeks at Purdue, um, which is a very strange place, because the place where they put you up is a very pleasant guest house. Um, to get to the library, you go underground, presumably because they have such awful winters. Nobody wants to be walking about. Oh, and a lot more stuff is at Smith College. So, so I've been to archives all over the place, yeah. So I did read the book, Cheaper by the Dozen. Mm -hmm. And then I also read um, the sequel to it, Bells on Their Toes, mm -hmm. which was wonderful because it was like now also about her daughters who were growing up. But mm -hmm. Lillian Gilbreth is also featured in that book too. So yeah. that's an interesting read. Yeah. yeah. But it's it's um, the Ernestine, the old the oldest, the second daughter, second surviving daughter, um, <clears throat> wrote the original Cheaper by the Dozen, and it was about three times as long as it is now. And her brother, who was a newspaper editor, said, "Ernie, nobody will buy this," um, and so he whipped it into shape. So he was the one with much more of a sense of humour than Ernie, I think, and. Um, <clears throat> So that's what it was. And it came out in 1948, 49, at a time when women were being encouraged to go back into the, into the home after the war. And the, this is why I think, at least, that uh, um, Lily, at least in Chief of By the Dozen, Lillian's professional 
um, accomplishments are a bit underplayed mm -hmm. and that she is very domestic and kindly, which she was not at all domestic. She couldn't cook, never did. Um, yeah. <laughs> she had help all her life. Um, <laughs> but the idea that she, and, and I'm, I'm also not too sure, she liked the children once they get got to be big and noisy. She, I think she liked them when they were little and quiet. So. <laughs> but I liked Lily, and I'm, that sounds though like I don't, I did. But um, I think the, the way she's portrayed in Chief of By the Dozen is, does her in, an injustice. Okay. Um, okay, Sarah wants to know in what way she's a philanthropist. No, she didn't distribute her own wealth because she never had much wealth. Uh, but what she did was encourage other people, particularly white people, to support good causes. And so um, in, um, in Boston, um, those white people who are supporting the Liberator and the abolitionist movement generally would be supporting the, the coloured um, ladies sanitary committee and for the shelter the home for aged colored women she got um, sort of old old money providence involved like the goddard family for example are very much involved in that but if you can persuade um, wealthy and influential people to support something then um, her perhaps she's not a philanthropist but she's a uh, what's the word, uh, an inspirer of philanthropy, a midwife. <laughs> now they call it influencer. Influencer, I was thinking what that word was, yeah. That's, that's a new one. Yeah. When you mentioned Bannister, is this um, the the artist Bannister after the uh, the gal the art gallery at Rhode Island College? Is that named yeah. after him? Um, it'll be him. Yeah. yeah, I gave a talk when they opened that whenever a oh. long time ago. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yes, I, I, I like him too. But um, he's uh, yeah, he, he's an interesting guy but I think Christiana is as well. The house they lived in was belonged to Brown. And again, when I was doing this work a few a number of years ago, it, they used it to store old refrigerators. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I remember Jane, when you gave a first the talk about Madame Jumel, mm -hmm. um, uh, was it at, the historical society i can't remember where it was uh, but a couple came up from new york uh, mm -hmm. who had heard that this talk was going to be happening because they lived across the street right. from the from the mansion they did. And it was so interesting that connection yeah. um uh, we then went down and and met with with those folks and uh they did a big event at the jumel mansion that was based on her life uh, yeah. your research i think yeah. But it was well, extraordinary. Somebody wrote a book, which, which is why I haven't published this. And I, I don't actually agree with how she's done this, but it, whether there's a need for two books about Madame Jumel, I don't know. But I've just reread it. And she does not mention the Solomon Northup connection. Remember Solomon Northup is 12 years a slave the guy who was tricked into uh, slavery, although he was a free black from Saratoga. Um, Mrs. Northup and young Northup worked for Madame Jumel in her kitchen for two or three years in New York because she had a house in Saratoga as well. And this is probably where she came across them. And so her, she, she's a very multifaceted sort of person. Uh, the woman who wrote this not bad book about her is an art historian. So she concentrates a lot on the art collection and not to the, um, she, she use, does the rest as well. But um, that isn't, I think, how I would do it. Uh, 
Nancy Prophet has two spellings of her last name? No. Is or, it F-I-T or P-H-E-T? I, I've always seen <coughs> P-H-E-T. I've always seen it that way. Some of the family do spell it with an F. I think it must have flashed by. That's why I have a note. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, she, her father was, one of her parents was Native American, the other was Black, which is very common in, in South County. And again, when I was doing this research a while ago, you know, down Meeting Street, where the post office used to be, right? Mm -hmm. I'm getting very Rhode Island, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> and next to where the post office used to be, there's a little parking lot now. And there was a little red house there. And I went and interviewed a very, very old woman in that house. I think she was well into her 90s and a bit forgetful. And she had known Elizabeth Prophet as a youngster. Oh. And because at that time, a lot of black people lived on, on Meeting Street and around that area. And Elizabeth Prophet had worked as a, a serving girl occasionally, not, not regularly, to some of the for big houses if they were having parties. And so I think this woman's sister had worked with her or something like that. And um, so she had a few memories about that, but it, it was very hard talking to her because she only had like one memory and it would loop around. It's very <laughs> difficult um, talking to people whose memories have nearly gone. But she did seem to remember that. So that little house has gone. And that woman's father, this is about the black community, was the nurse for that street. And he was the only person with a telephone in the street at that time. So, and that little red house, which is gone, where there's a parking lot, um, was a quite historic place. Right, I think we're, we're right at 1.30. So um, I think we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, unless there are other questions, maybe now the final final questions. If people have to go, obviously it's one thirty, so people can so, sort on with their day. And thanks, Jane, for all you've done for women's history in Rhode Island and and Thank for your you talk so today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, with that, any final questions or anyone else, other questions or? Thank you, Alex. Okay. That's the thank you. Thank the you. All right. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everybody. Have a nice rest of your week. Thank you. Too. Thank you so much, Jane and Alex and Risa, everybody who put this together and came. It was just illuminating. <laughs> we've come Very a long nice. way, and yet we 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 still have the same problems. Yeah. Jane, I just want to say you presented so beautifully, and you're a pleasure to listen to. I could understand every word you said. Even though and, I talk uh, like a foreigner. What is that? Even though I talk with this funny accent. <laughs>